welcome. You're signed into Rooted Digital, that is Rooted Fellowships online digital community and we're so thrilled that you're joining us this morning. My name is Pinky Mukwena and I have the privilege of hosting us this morning. So we're going to be spending this morning together as we navigate a new series in our church that is Advent. I'll chat about that a little bit later, but we always say that Rooted Fellowship is about three things and these three things are core to who we are as a church. Do you remember what they are? Have no worries, I'll tell you. That is that we are gospel-centered, we are disciple-making, and that we are transcultural. These, I mentioned, are core to who we are. If you'd like to know more about what they mean and why we are about these things, head over to our website, will you? That is rootedfellowship.com, and you can double-click on whatever you'd like to double-click on. Um, speaking about double-clicking, we're also a generous church, and that is because much has been given to us. So it's our delight to give and be generous with each other, in the church, you name it. So if you'd like to be a part of our giving community, um, head over to our website as well. There's information on how you can give to the church, um, but also it's not about just giving. If you have a need that you'd like for us to assist you with, be it emotional, financial, however, send us an email at community at rootedfellowship.com and someone will definitely get in touch with you. So I mentioned earlier that we are in a season about Advent. It's exciting. We're sitting back, reflecting on what God has done through Jesus, sending him on earth. Pretty exciting stuff. Last week, um, Elder Kenny, one of our elders, um, transitioned with us on how we moved from despair to hope. And we're not just leaving it there, family. We're heading on over this week. Another one of our elders, Stephen, is going to help us transition from chaos to peace. So I know I definitely want to sit in on that one and, and be a part of it. So go make your cup of coffee quickly and get your water because we're diving into that just now. Tico, ya 
Advent. Of all the seasons in the church calendar, Advent probably feels the most familiar. As Christians, Advent helps us deconstruct and deny the unhelpful stories that we find ourselves caught up in, especially those connected to our culture's concept of Christmas, which is oftentimes filled with individualism and consumerism. Instead, we get to reconstruct and embrace the true story of the gospel in our lives. We recognize the weight of sin and brokenness personally, corporately and cosmically, and we see with clear eyes our need for Jesus. Advent shows us how the light of the birth of Christ appeared against a backdrop of darkness, depravity and despair. This is why our Advent theme for 2020 is one of King Jesus breaking into the darkness, despair, chaos and brokenness. We cannot rush to celebrate the arrival of Jesus without staring the darkness and despair that he comes to heal us from in the face. 2020 has been a hard year for all of us and Advent helps us to take stock of that and also helps lead us to celebrate the eternal hope that we have in the arrival of King Jesus to usher in a new kingdom. We will be drawing these themes of darkness, despair, chaos and brokenness from the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms has been described as the anatomy of the soul because it represents all of our human emotions. It is honest and yet redemptive. We pray that the Advent series will be a blessing to all our Rooted Fellowship family. Tis the season. Blessings. Hey everyone, and welcome to Rooted's digital platform. If we haven't met yet, my name is Stephen, and I have the privilege today to walk us through God's Word in part three of a four-part sermon series as we journey through the season of Advent. If you're not familiar with the Christian tradition of Advent, uh, Advent is basically the four weeks leading up to Christmas when we celebrate Christ's birth. And as Christians celebrate Advent, what we do is we prepare for the birth of Christ. We prepare to celebrate Christmas, um, but we also look forward to Christ's return one day. As we celebrate Advent, what we do is we remember how uh, the light of Christ's appearing in the world came against a backdrop of sin, of darkness, of despair, of brokenness that was in the world. And so our Advent theme in this sermon series this year is one of King Jesus breaking in to our darkness, into our despair, into our brokenness. And as today, sermon will show into our chaos. You see, we cannot rush straight to the celebrations of Christ's birth without first 
staring into the face of the brokenness and despair from which he came to save us. And uh, in this sermon series, we've been using the book of Psalms uh, as we navigate through Advent. So two weeks ago, we heard from our lead pastor, One Mukhatle, as he preached through Psalm 88. And the theme there was from darkness to light. And then last week, we heard from Kenny. And Kenny preached from Psalm 142. And the theme was from despair to hope. And today we'll be looking at Psalm 46. And the theme will be from chaos to peace. From chaos to peace. And if there ever was a chaotic year, it was 2020, right? And so let's read together. Let's read Psalm 46 and see what encouragement the Bible has for us in the midst of chaos. Turn with me. It should also be on your screen. I'm reading from Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her, she will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Won't you pray with me even now uh, to ask God to help us as we navigate this text? Father God, we thank you for your word once again uh, given to us today. Thank you, Father, that you are with us and that you speak to us in the midst of whatever situation we're in, in the midst of chaos even. And I pray, Father, that now as we turn to your word, that you would calm our anxious thoughts, that you would show us uh, something more of who you are. You would help us to truly believe in who you are, that we would go away from today just deeply encouraged Um, in our lives because we know that you're with us and that you're for us. Lord, would you build our faith today through your word, for your glory. Amen. Perhaps keep Psalm 46 open in front of you. Uh, Perhaps you have it on a digital device or an old-fashioned hard copy Bible. Um, It'll be good to to be continually looking at it as we meditate on this incredible passage. As we start going through the passage, Uh, Just a few high-level observations about the structure of the psalm. Um, One can quite easily break it into three sections, uh, verse 1 to 3, and then verse 4 to 6, and then verse 7 to 11. Uh, Verses 1 to 3, uh, we see the peace that God brings despite the chaos in the earth. So we see chaos on the earth. We see roaring seas and mountains falling. And then in verses 4 to 6, we see the peace that God gives despite the chaos in the nations. So we see nations in uproar, we see kingdoms falling, and yet we see that God brings peace. And then the third section, verses 7 to 11, in itself it has its own little structure. It's kind of like a sandwich structure where verse 7 and 11 are identical. Both of them read, the Lord Almighty is with us, the God of Jacob is our fortress. And then inside that little sandwich in verse 10, we have what I think is the climax of Psalm 46. Verse 10, where God suddenly speaks, where he is, his voice is heard, and he says, be still and know that I am God. And so it's in the, in the middle, in the climax of that little sandwich in the third section towards the end of the psalm that we see the journey from chaos to peace be completed. And so that is the title for today's talk, From Chaos to Peace. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, the pandemic we've been experiencing this year has been chaotic. 
And it, for me, it's changed the way I read certain parts of scripture. And this psalm would be one of those examples. I think before the chaos of this year, um, what is described in Psalm 46 might have felt like an exaggeration. Maybe it was just metaphorical. I mean, mountains falling into the ocean um, or even the wars that, that are described in the psalm. You know, maybe I would have thought that that is something that could have only happened in past eras, far in the history of the earth where, where wars were more common. Uh, in the modern world today, however, you know, we no longer have serious war. Uh, we enjoy the benefits of science, of modern medicine, technology, economic prosperity, right? Well, enter 2020. Up until 2020, things like nuclear wars, global warming, a global pandemic even, it seemed unreal. It made for a wonderful movie theme, but it didn't feel like something that was going to happen tomorrow in our actual lives. And this pandemic, I think, has taught us, or at least reminded us, that life is indeed fragile and that things can become chaotic much faster than we might have thought. Sometimes we get these kinds of reminders in our own personal lives as well. Maybe our health fails us. Perhaps a key relationship breaks down. We may lose our source of income. Maybe someone very close to us passes away suddenly. And our lives are fragile and they can easily be turned to chaos. And I'm aware that for some of you perhaps, and no doubt for many in our country, that this pandemic may have seemed like a first world problem. That yes, the first world now has an actual problem, but for you, perhaps the struggle of 2020 is just another punch in the gut in a long set of struggles that you've been battling with for a long time. Whether those struggles could be different kinds of pain, maybe it is the battle to be financially secure, maybe it is a battle with mental health, perhaps being on the receiving end of injustice, perhaps loneliness, you can fill in the blank. The good news is that Psalm 46 and God himself is not surprised by the kind of chaos that actually does happen in the world and that actually does happen in our lives. Psalm 46 describes the very worst kinds of chaos that happens in the world. I mean, in that first section, verses two and three, we see these natural disasters. There's pictures of earthquakes and tsunamis, nation, sorry, mountains quaking and falling into the sea. And I guess a global pandemic, it feels like it kind of could fit into that category of, of the earth in chaos. And verse 5 and 6, we see a different kind of chaos. We see the dark clouds of war, where nations are in uproar and kingdoms are falling. And I think uh, this year, well, I think what we've seen is almost the closest in my lifetime to a global disaster, where it feels as if the world is almost falling apart. And maybe it's in your own life situations where it feels like the world is falling apart. And so it's encouraging to know that actually the images seen in this psalm they kind of are the end of the world images. They're, they're apocalyptic images. I mean, the earth giving way, the mountains falling into the sea. And yet even then, the psalm says, we will not fear because God is with us. That's tremendously encouraging because if the end of the world is not a reason to fear, then surely our current problems are also not a reason to fear. Our current problems are also not too big for God. And so Psalm 46 encourages us that there is no reason to fear even now. But actually, the truths and encouragements of Psalm 46 are not only encouraging for now, but they're important for us to learn because there may still be greater trials to come, both in the world and in our lives. And the great thing about this psalm is that as much as it recognizes the chaos that happens in the world, uh, it also moves us to encouragement. This song is from start to finish a song of encouragement. It is a song that the, at the start of the psalm, and it's, it's part of its title, it says it's a song. And it feels to me kind of like a battle song, like a war cry. I think of, of cheerleaders at the side of a sports match. Perhaps you were at school and can remember days like that with cheerleaders singing, we've got the spirit. Um, and in the case of this psalm in particular, uh, it, is, it is known as a, a Zion hymn. So Zion is just another name for Jerusalem capital city of Israel and the place where God's temple was and where the temple being associated with where God dwelt with his people. And so this hymn, it's kind of a Zion hymn. There's references to the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. And so it's not an individualistic song. It's a song sung by the team, sung by the family of God, the people of God, 
the nation of God as they go together into battle. And so throughout this battle song, we see an incredible picture of God as a mighty fortress. And we're just going to think about what that means for a little while. God is a mighty fortress. We see it in verse 1 and verse 7 and verse 11. In verse 1, it says, God is our refuge and strength. A refuge, uh, I understand to be like a safe place, uh, particularly where you might take shelter in the midst of a storm or a freezing cold night if you're out doing a multi-day hike in the mountains, something like that. So refuge. Verse 7 and 11, we see the identical phrase, the Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. And whereas a refuge kind of is a place to take shelter against the elements, uh, a fortress feels like a place to take shelter against enemy armies. And so I think it's worth getting into this imagery, thinking, just feeling that, what it is to think of God as a fortress. Maybe it's worth picturing a fortress even just in your head. Uh, or even looking at uh, fortresses we've seen. I thought of a fortress like, like Helm's Deep uh, in, in The Lord of the Rings. Perhaps you've seen that picture before. Maybe picture your own even safer, more powerful fortress. Perhaps it is built high up in a mountain, where the mountain itself is part of the fortress. High up, out of reach, unassailable, impregnable. Perhaps there are layers upon layers of protective walls, and chambers inside chambers. This is what God is to his people. God is our massive fortress. Yet how quickly we forget this and flee elsewhere. Even the nation of Israel, who themselves did witness miraculous victories over enemy armies, and they saw God's sovereignty over nature as they walked through the middle of the sea, and as they received manna from heaven, even them, they were quick to forget and stop trusting God. And so what about us? When we are under attack and when there's chaos raging all around, do we run to God? Or do we wander outside of the castle walls in search of something out there that might satisfy us, that might secure us? Do we hide our hearts from God in the middle of the chaos and the times of testing? Well, how do we respond to those times? Do we perhaps work harder? Do we try to improve ourselves? Or maybe we try to escape from reality. We try to hide away from the reality out there that is putting all the stress on us. Maybe we escape to entertainment. Maybe it is to the comforts of food or too much drink. Or maybe we retreat into a relationship that we probably shouldn't actually be in. Maybe we try to medicate our pain with things like pornography. The truth is that all of these things are never going to save us. In fact, turning away from God to these kinds of escapes is only going to push us further away from the true fortress, which is God himself. We need to learn to run to the Father, believing that he really is the safest and best place we could possibly be. I think it's worth stopping and asking why. Why would we not run to God? What would stop us from running to Him with all of our hearts? I wonder if it's because we fail to believe something about who He is. Perhaps we fail to believe that He's in full control. Or maybe we don't fully believe that He's really good to us. Like Maybe He's good to those people out there or there, but is He really good to me? Or is he good in every area of my life? Maybe I'm okay with the way he's blessed me in these areas, but it feels like there's some gap, some crack in God's goodness when it comes to a specific area of my life. Now, I think we need to search our hearts and see if maybe there is some unbelief lurking in there which needs to be repented of and replaced with the truth that we see in Psalm 46, which is that God is with us, that God is for us, that he is a mighty fortress, fully in control, and the best and safest place we could ever be in. And so we have this amazing picture of God here presented to us as a mighty fortress of his people, high up and unassailable. But think for a moment, what could be a fatal flaw in a mountaintop fortress? Perhaps pause the video and think about that. You may have guessed it, but a water supply. Think about that for a moment. If you're a mountaintop fortress, 
without a reliable source of water, you could be very vulnerable to a siege. Never mind, the fortress we see in Psalm 46 is sorted. In verse 4 we read, There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. See, in stark contrast to the previous verse where we saw raging waters and the chaos of the sea representing destruction, here we see a picture of a river which is peaceful, stable, reliable, calm. It satisfies God's people and makes them glad. And so if the psalmist is building this picture of God as a mighty fortress, I wonder what do you think this, this river could represent? Well, there are various possibilities. I think the river could represent God's truth, could represent His Word, or maybe it's His provision, the way He provides for His people, the way He gives them life and sustains them. All of those things could perhaps be true. But the idea that rings true for me that I I like and which several other commentators have suggested is that this river could be the blessing of God's own presence with His people. That That this is the river of God's presence with his people. Why do I say that? Why do I think the river represents God's presence? I'm glad you asked. Hashtag Pastor Onetrix. Um, Shout out to him. Uh, Well, immediately after reading, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the verse continues, the holy place where the most high dwells, God is within her. So the verse with the river, it moves towards This idea of God dwelling in his holy place and God being in the city. More than that, I think throughout the psalm we see this theme of God's presence and we see it going hand in hand alongside the the picture of a fortress. Every time the fortress is mentioned, we see God's presence mentioned. In verse 1, we see God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. And then in verses 7 and 11, the identical phrase again, The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. And so we have this picture presented to us of God as a mighty fortress who protects his people, but who is also present with his people, satisfying them, making them glad. For us, thousands of years later, since the writing of the psalm, we, of course, have received much more revelation of this God who is with us. At Christmas time, we often refer to Jesus by the name of Emmanuel, which means God with us. In fact, this is what Christmas and Advent is all about, that in Jesus Christ, God became flesh, making his dwelling amongst us. You see, Jesus, this God with us, he left the privileges of heaven to come down into the raging waters, into the pain and suffering and chaos of our world, He became a human and was tempted in every way just as we are. And so he can sympathize with us. He knows what we're going through. See, Jesus, in a very literal sense, came into the world to bring God's presence to us. To bring God's presence, this beautiful river whose streams satisfy God's people. In fact, Jesus himself said, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. And the Gospel of John goes on to say that Jesus was speaking about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. And friends, we not only live this side of Jesus, but we also live this side of Pentecost, which is where the Holy Spirit was poured out so that all who are in Christ can enjoy the indwelling presence of God, the Holy Spirit. It's incredible. At this point, if Reno, one of our church planting residents, was preaching, he would be jumping up and down saying, God is brilliant. How epic are the ways in which God has fulfilled this picture of his presence flowing like a river among his people. Surely God becoming flesh dwelling with us, then pouring out His Spirit to dwell within us, would have been beyond the imagination even of this writer in Psalm 46. Obviously, God Himself is the author behind the author, but it is an incredible fulfillment 
of this picture of God's presence as, as a river of water to his people. There's another aspect of, of God's presence here in the psalm that I don't want us to miss. And that is that it is not an individualistic picture. This river flows through the city of God. And the whole psalm is a corporate hymn. It's, it's a battle song sung by God's people to each other. And they sing, God is our refuge and strength. Therefore, we will not fear. Referring to the city of God, God is within her. She will not fall. It's not so much about me or you making it, but it's about God's people. And we know that God's plan to build a people for himself goes well beyond just the, the city of Jerusalem. We know that in the church, God is creating a new Jerusalem, one new humanity, a people from every nation, both Jews and Gentiles, as the book of Ephesians explains. But also, not only is he creating this, this one universal church from every generation and every nation, but there's also something special about the local church. In the same book of Ephesians, Paul at some point turns to the local church in Ephesus and says that in Jesus, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. And so as much as God gives his indwelling Holy Spirit to us as individuals who believe, there is still some sense in which God dwells corporately amongst his people by his spirit. And I think this is a timely encouragement for us as the church, especially in the context of what's happened this year where we've had to resort to virtual church uh, and we've been socially distanced from each other, it's been a tough time. And so I hope and I pray that, that even this Advent season, we would reflect and, and, and maybe learn the lessons from this year to again appreciate and enjoy the blessing of fellowship more than maybe we previously did. And may we recommit even next year to fellowship. May we recommit to each other and in this way enjoy the blessing of knowing God and being with God in the context of his people. As we move towards the third and final section of the psalm, in verses 7 to 11, uh, and we saw earlier how this section is sandwiched uh, by this picture of God as a fortress, um, we see in this section, verses 7 to 11, that on either side we have him as a fortress again, this passive form of protection. We also see in verses 7 to 11 that God is very active in the world. Verse 8 invites us to come and see what the Lord has done. Come and see what the Lord has done, verse 8 says, and what has he done? The answer might come as a bit of a surprise. It says, come and see the desolations he has brought on the earth. Desolations? That sounds ominous, right? Maybe it's judgment. But as we read on in verse 9, we see that the desolations are in fact to end wars, to destroy the tools of war. It writes, he breaks the bow, he shatters the spear, and he burns the shields. See, God has intervened in the chaos and he has acted to bring peace. Whilst this may have had immediate relevance to the nation of Israel when they were at war, and I think this would also really be an encouragement to anyone going through a time of war. I believe the ultimate desolations that God has brought have been delivered by Jesus. See, Jesus is many, many things. But one of the things that he is, is he is God's warrior king. Jesus is the warrior who stepped into our chaos. He set his face like flint, as the Bible says, dressed up for battle. He set his face towards Jerusalem. And towards the cross, Jesus went into battle on our behalf and nobody could persuade him out of it. Not Peter, who rebuked Jesus when he said he had to die. Not the devil, who tempted Jesus in the desert towards a more comfortable outcome. Not the crowds who wanted to make him king before it was actually time for that to happen. No, Jesus went to the cross. Jesus was dead set on doing that for us. He went outside the city walls, literally outside of the walls of Jerusalem, to the hill of Calvary, where he defeated the greatest enemies of sin and death in a battle that cost his life. He did this to bring us back to the Father, back inside the city walls, back inside the mighty fortress that is God himself. And that is our position in Christ. That is our position in God. Ephesians tells us that God raised us up with Christ, that we are now seated with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. 
That is our reality. We are in the fortress of God himself, having been raised with Christ. And Ephesians goes on to teach us that at the cross, Jesus made peace. He made peace between us and God, but he also made peace between us and each other. And that's a fundamental truth that we hold on to here at Rooted. It's foundational to our transcultural narrative that God has made peace in the world where there certainly has been enmity and division between us. The injustices perpetrated by people and by people groups against each other could not and cannot be swept under the carpet. But in Jesus, provision has been made for peace and reconciliation. The punishment that was on him has brought us peace. And Jesus, God, has made us into a new community, a family from all peoples for the display of God's wisdom and grace. Surely he has broken the bow and shattered the spear. And so this Christmas, as we celebrate Jesus, who is God with us, let us come and see what God has done through him to conquer sin and death and bring us peace. As we move towards the end, we see in verse 10, the psalm reaches its climax. Suddenly, God speaks. Up until now, it's been God's people speaking to each other. And now in verse 10, God himself speaks. And he says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And so as we begin to wrap up, Let's pause and consider what it might mean to be still this Christmas. And I want to point us to three ways for us to be still. The first is, be still, silenced in fearful trust and awe of God. Be still, silenced in fearful trust and awe of God. See, as God speaks here, he silences. Not only does he silence us, but he silences the raging waters. He silences the nations with his voice. And certainly the major response from us as we read the psalm needs to be one of being still. God speaks briefly here, but very clearly, and he commands us to be still. But the command is not just be still. The command is also to know that I'm God. Moreover, he goes on to spell out what that will mean. And it is not, I will solve all your problems, I will calm all your storms, but rather, I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And this changes the focus from the chaos of our lives and our needs to God and His glory. And this reminded me of a lesson I learned earlier this year, um, as, as at Rooted we preached through the book of Mark. And specifically the passage where Jesus is in the boat and he calms the storm. And in the past, I've often held on to that passage as an encouragement to me that in the midst of the storms of my life, that Jesus is in the boat and he's in control and he can calm the storms. But I think what I learned this time was from the disciples' response after he'd calmed the storm. You see, once Jesus had calmed the storm, the disciples were more terrified than they were during the storm. They looked at each other and they said, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. And in some ways, this should be our response. That in the midst of the chaos, we might see something more of who God is. We might see something more of who Jesus is. And we'd be silenced by that. That we would be silenced into the kind of fear of God that is a healthy fear of God. A fearful trust of God. And an awe of who he is. And so this Christmas, may our response be sort of like that of the disciples in the boat, where we again exclaim, who is this? Who is this Jesus? He is God himself. The second way in which we could be still this Christmas is to be still trusting God for the future. Be still trusting God for the future. That as we look back on God's provision through Jesus, how he fulfilled his promises and drew us near through Jesus, we can also trust God for the future that if he did not spare his own son for us, how much more will he along with him give us all things? We can trust God for 2021 
certainly uh, it is probably going to have enough challenges of its own. But even beyond that, in a bigger sense, we can trust Jesus that he will return one day. He will make all things new. He will restore us. He will restore the world. He will deal comprehensively with injustice. He will end all suffering. And that we can, in fact, look forward to the day where we see a full realization of the picture that's kind of hinted at in Psalm 46, the city of God, and even more fully described in the book of Revelation, where we see a new Jerusalem, where the river of the water of life flows from the throne of God and of the Lamb, and people from every nation and language will worship God together as one family in Jesus forever. That is a picture to look forward to. So let us be still and trust God for the future. And lastly, be still, perhaps for the first time. That there may be some of you for whom the raging noises inside your head and inside your heart, the noises of brokenness, bitterness, and restlessness, may never yet have met, the, have met the calming voice of God. You may never have experienced the embrace of the Father's love. Perhaps now is the time, even for the first time, to finally stop fighting. Stop fighting against God. Let go of whatever grievances you may have, even against Him. Be still. Let the message of the gospel land and take root in your heart. Come inside from the chaos. Come inside from the very real dangers of not being right with God. Come inside the fortress. It's the safest place you could ever be in the Father's loving arms. And that is the invitation to you. That is His invitation. So why not make this Christmas, even today, the time to accept God's amazing gift of being forgiven, and being right with Him, which He accomplished and made possible through the life and death of Jesus Christ. So as we close, let us remember that through Jesus, God has brought us peace, bringing God's presence to us, bringing us into God's presence. And therefore, even in the midst of the chaos that continues to rage around us, we can be still and know that He is God, He is with us, and He will be victorious in the end. Let us close with a prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you that in Jesus you stepped down into our world, into our chaos, into our lives, and that you intervened. Thank you for bringing us peace and making us right with you. And I pray that right now, today, in this Christmas time, Lord, you would still our hearts. You would calm our anxious thoughts. You would calm the raging arguments in our head the things that keep us up at night. And that, Lord, you'd help us to lift our eyes above those things and to see something more of who you are. Holy Spirit, would you help us to grasp the truth of who you are? Help us to rest in the Father. Help us to put our trust again in you, our mighty fortress. And we pray this with so much thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.